The running Utes end up falling short to the Arizona Wildcats in a triple overtime thriller at the Huntsman Center. Sadly, ending the home game win streak of the 2023-24 season. But nevertheless, very, very entertaining game. Some wild moments, some uh, really big performances from some players. What went wrong? What occurred in all three of those overtimes and in regulation? And uh, why did it go to triple overtime? All of that and more right here on this week's episode of Believe in Utes. As always, I'm your host, Jake Popoff, a recent U of U graduate, and uh, I'm here talking Utes with y'all. I love doing this. I uh, I love checking in with football updates and news. I also love checking in with basketball. This is going to be a more uh, basketball-focused episode. Going to be talking about the running Utes, sort of where do they stand in their current situation, right, in this 23-24 season. Uh, what is the outlook for the rest of the season looking like? I've already touched on that a couple episodes prior, but want to kind of dive in a little bit further now that that's sort of big. Um, that date that everybody had circled on their calendars in this Arizona Wildcats matchup at home, now that it's past us, the result did not go the way that we had hoped or anticipated. But nevertheless, we did put together a very strong victory over the Colorado Buffaloes at home. So I at least got one of my predictions right from a couple episodes ago. I had sort of predicted that we were going to beat Washington State on the road. Um, That did not happen. We ended up falling to Washington State. And uh, what was that, four games ago now? And then against Washington, I did have that one down as a loss. That did go that way, unfortunately. And then uh, I got one right. I got um, Colorado at home this past Saturday. That, uh, that game did go as planned. We got the victory done. We had continued the home game win streak up until that point. And then again, obviously, it fell. we fell short of uh, maintaining that win streak here against the Wildcats tonight on Thursday. But, um, yeah, the Colorado game, that was, I mean, it was a good, solid home win. Uh, I think it could be, it was a game that went as expected or as to be expected. Uh, Gabe Madsen, I believe, had 21 points. He was, you know, shooting the lights out as always. Uh, not too much production from Brandon Carlson. He had 30 minutes, but only five points in that game. So, uh, you know, everyone's going to have an off night. So that was Brandon Carlson's off night maybe. But, hey, still, uh, you know, still contributed in other areas, had had a few boards, had a few assists. Um, but then ultimately other guys just stepped up, right? We saw Davon Smith almost getting another triple-double in uh, in that Colorado game he was one what was it one assist or one rebound shy I want to say he was one assist shy of another triple double I mean I don't want to sound like I'm uh you know uh, what's who's the uh, Chris Collinsworth when he talks about Patrick Mahomes right we've all heard those kind of those little clips and whatnot but uh but D- Davon Smith deserves his praises and he is just ex- exceptionally fun to watch and um, really just a brilliant player. I mean, his speed, we talked about that before. He's the fastest guy on the court among both amongst both teams. Um, he can just get around people with ease. He's got, a, what is it, a 46-inch vertical, standing only six feet tall. So he's, he's just an electric athlete, really fun guy to watch. And you can tell that the players on this running Utes team feel more confident when he's on the court and when the ball is in his hands when he's the one dishing out dimes and uh, looking for assists and stuff like that. Just really that electric playmaker that the Utes have been kind of lacking over the last few seasons. So, and, and his, you know, his sort of flashiness and his style of play, you can tell it rubs off onto these other players. That's why we're seeing guys like Gabe Madsen taking more circus threes. That's why we're seeing guys like uh, Hunter Erickson as a shorter kid really start to step up and, and dish the ball really well, start to take some of those big time shots and, and, you know, hit some of them. I, I still think that uh, Craig Smith might be seeing something in Hunter Erickson that the Utah fan base doesn't necessarily see. I think that it's hard to argue that the kid doesn't have potential and that he's not a team player. You know, he, you can tell he's hungry and he's got that um, he's got that sort of fire in his eyes, right? Every time he's on the court, you can tell that he wants to be making big plays and he wants to be a big contributor. But I think his production up until this point in the season just hasn't really been equivalent in my opinion to the amount of minutes he's had on the court uh i say that because in this arizona game we saw cole badgema only had around i want to say 18 to 20 minutes on the court 
and just wasn't really being put into a lot of uh, you know crucial crunch time situations whereas hunter erickson was in for the majority of the game i think he had 35 minutes or something like that um so it just it, it was a little bit interesting to me and it has been the whole season that uh you know spreading out playing time between guys like hunter and cole uh it just seems like that should have a little bit more of an even spread um, and again, no, no hate towards Hunter Erickson. I just think that as he grows older within this program and gets a little bit more mature, has a little bit more of the division one experience, you know, I'm assuming he's going to return next season. I think he will be a key playmaker. Um, but in the meantime, it just seems like he's been thrown into some situations that maybe don't make the most sense. But anyways, going back to Davon Smith, uh, you know, almost had that triple double in the Colorado game. And then sure enough, what does he do the next game against the Arizona Wildcats? Now, sure, he might have had three overtimes to help him get there. But again, the guy is a triple-double threat every single night. He hit it tonight. Uh, I'm recording this right after the game, so this is a fresh reaction. Uh, I mean, what an electric game, huh? That was just, uh, man, it was a, it was unfortunate that it didn't go the way we had planned. But... Um, so fun to watch. I mean, what a roller coaster of emotions. You know, as I was sitting there watching the game, it was kind of a back and forth in my mind of shoot, you know, how is this podcast episode gonna go? How am I gonna how am I gonna go about this and discuss this game? You know, is it going to be with with uh super cheery eyed and was I going to be super excited about the fact that we got the victory, or was it going to be, you know, oh bummer, we didn't get it done? And man, I had to go back and forth between those two narratives at least 30 times throughout that game with the amount of lead changes and overtimes and just drama that that game brought uh, really really exciting stuff to watch but going further into that game you know obviously as i mentioned it didn't go the way we hoped but um still a very very i want to say promising performance by the running mutes i think that game solidified my opinions and hopefully a lot of other running mutes and just Utah fans' opinions that uh, this team does have playoff caliber, right? This is a playoff caliber team. Sorry for to phrase that more correctly. But this team it, it will make a run in March Madness. I think going into this game, according to ESPN, the Utes were projected to be an eighth seed um, in March Madness, and Arizona projected to be a two seed. So, you know, right there already, you can see, just say a hypothetical eight seed versus two seed, going to a triple overtime, just electric game. Uh, that really goes to show that this team should be in the tournament come March, and they should uh, they should give a lot of teams a really good run for their money because this Utah men's basketball team, as soon as that sort of final gear shifts and they really start driving on, uh, on just all cylinders and uh, everything starts going the way it could go, with the potential of the players on the team and, and just the potential of this team as a machine, uh, that's when things are going to start getting really exciting, in my opinion. And, and they already are, right? We have a winning record. We are uh, projected to be just right there in the middle of the teams getting into the tournament. So, you know, it, it, kind of an underdog at this point. But but people nationally are starting to take notice that, uh, hey, did you guys see that? The, the Utes came back from a 16-point deficit at halftime with six minutes left in regulation. The Utes went on an 11-0 run against the Wildcats, who are the number six team in the country, projected to be a two-seed in the tournament. And uh, the Utes brought it back to a tie game with six minutes left and then battled for the rest of those six minutes to get it to go to overtime. And then, of course, you know, battled for another 15 minutes to just really try to really try to seal that game and and get that other home victory and and i guess fully prove to the national college basketball scene that hey we mean business but i i think that this game although it didn't result as a w on the stat sheet it uh it definitely woke a lot of people up and made a lot of people pay attention to uh what utah basketball is doing this season and what they are capable of Something that we've got to acknowledge that uh, most Utah fans at this point are well aware of, and it was very apparent in this game versus the Wildcats, is that this Utah team is not good at all from the free throw line, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. We're a very good team from the perimeter, and our and our shot percentage game by game is is very good. But for some reason, we just really, really struggle with free throws. I mean, we saw Brandon Carlson missing a whole bunch of free throws tonight. 
and one conversions that just he wasn't able to you know convert and uh and just in some crucial moments where you know we were just finally starting to get a spark going or we were just starting to shift the momentum in our direction and then a free throw would miss or two free throws would miss back to back or shoot three free throws almost by Brandon Carlson when he got fouled on that three pointer he missed the first two barely made that last one but i just i i can't really I can't fully understand why this team struggles so bad from the free throw line. I mean, 10 of 21 from free throw against the number six team in the country is purely unacceptable. That's 11 points that you should. Okay. You know, no team is perfect, right? No team is going to go 21 for 21 from free throw necessarily, but say, even if you can go 18 from 21 or 16 from 21, well, all of a sudden you're not only, you're not only matched up with the amount of points that the Wildcats have, but you know, you're maybe doing better or there was just a lot of, there was a lot of moments in regulation and in overtime where it was, man, if we would have just hit those two or those three or those 10 free throws, we would be right there in this thing, or we would be winning this game, uh, you know, handily. So I don't, I don't understand what it is with this Utah team that, that we just really struggle from the free throw line. It doesn't make any sense. It seems like the only logical thing to do would be, hey, every single practice, every single guy is going to put up at least 100 free throws and you're not leaving until you make 90 of them, right? And uh, and I'm sure that that is a big focus in practice. I'm sure free throws are something that the, that Craig Smith and his, uh, his coaching staff have been emphasizing and been, you know, implementing into practices. But... It just doesn't seem like throughout the season our free throw shooting has gotten any better, which again it just doesn't make sense. And it's it's kind of shocking to see that a guy like Kaba Kata is hitting more free throws than a Davon Smith, right? And Davon, as much as I you know I can talk highly of him, and we can all sit there and go, man, what an exceptional player, he you know such a great contributor to this team. Those are all true statements. Not very good from the free throw line. I mean, there was times where he missed both free throws, and you know. In a game with this high of stakes, you really can't afford to miss any free throws, let alone two in a row. And uh, yeah, that's, I mean, we were really just shooting ourselves in the foot with uh, at the free throw line. So again, 10 for 21 from free throw, really just uh, really hard to watch. I guess every time a guy would go to the line, you're clenching your teeth, you're waiting. You can tell in the, in the crowd, you know, everyone that was in the stands was just kind of, you know, clenched up when, when guys were at the free throw line and, and throwing up the U still never, you know, never going to not do that because you got to throw up the U for good measure. But, um, but it's just, you know, I think everyone is kind of like on edge when our team is shooting free throws for some reason. And it just doesn't make sense with how good of a shooting team we are and how many athletes and, and just pure shooters we have on this team. It seems like free throw shooting should be uh, near flawless, but not the case. So you got to continue to improve in that area. You got to continue to practice. You got to continue to allow guys to, uh, you know, get into the gym for extra hours to just focus on free throws. Because as you can see, there are going to be games that are determined by free throws. And I'm not saying that this game was solely determined by missed free throws, but that was definitely one of the few elements that were going against the Utah men's basketball program tonight that, uh, that made it very difficult to get the job done. So while Gabe Madsen, Davon Smith, Brandon Carlson, those sort of big three players were carrying the majority of the workload tonight, uh, Davon, I believe, had 49 minutes played. Gabe had the most minutes played at 51. And uh, Brandon, I believe, had 44 minutes played tonight. All of those guys in double digits when it comes to points. Um, and again, Davon with the triple double. So those three really shared the majority of the workload as far as minutes go. And, you know, down in the final stretch with those, those three overtimes, those were the guys that were just in the whole time. Um, I would have liked to see more rotation from the bench, right? When you've got guys like Ben Carlson and Lawson Lovering on the bench, why not keep a guy like Kaba Keda a little bit less, a little bit more fresh for lack of a better term, right? I don't think Kaba Keda ever looked sluggish or ever looked really tired to say the least because again he is just a freak of an athlete and he's always always on go mode right he's got one speed and uh was getting nasty blocks down to the final you know down to the final minutes was it was just uh you know working for it really you could tell Cable really really wanted to get the job done so uh you know 
uh, again, extreme props to, to Kata and uh, just what he's done for this team and how he's taken a big step up this season. But again, I would like to see, I would have liked to see a little bit more rotation with guys like Lawson Lovering, Ben Carlson getting in there. Uh, Lawson only had 15 minutes played um, with seven points, but uh, some big, you know, some really big points. He came in and had that and one converted, in, in, you know, towards the end of regulation. Um, Lawson is a very, very capable center. And I just don't see, you know, I don't necessarily see why there's not a little bit more rotation between those three centers to kind of keep them fresh in the paint, especially when you're going up against a team like Arizona, who likes to drive to the baseline, go up and take those contested layups down there in the paint. And, um, you know, I just think we could have used a little bit of, of some fresher sets of legs. Uh, and I get that through regulation, you want to keep your starters in, especially when you're trailing by 16 at halftime and you're trying to make a comeback. Um, so that is why those guys might have the majority of points on the stat sheet. But I think in overtime, you can throw in a loss and lovering in there. You can throw in a Ben Carlson, right? And I think Ben did get in in a couple of those overtimes for, you know, for a couple minutes or so. Um, but just never really allowed either of those two right, big playmakers, tall guys, uh, big bodies who are fully capable of guarding, uh, you know, anyone on that Arizona squad. Um, I just don't think they really allowed them, you know, the coaches didn't allow them enough time to sort of get into any kind of rhythm, uh, put up enough shots to feel like they were in just a, just a rhythm, really. They didn't, they didn't have any time to develop any sort of rhythm. And I think that that was something that could be a takeaway from this game is saying, hey, you know, moving forward, let's keep some of these guys a little bit more fresh just in case we do have to go to a triple overtime situation, right? You want your starters to feel like they have shared the workload of minutes with capable guys on the bench. But while we talk about playing time and minutes, I think it was incredible to see that K Bakeda in 35 minutes played or so only ended up with, I think, three fouls, two fouls. Correct me if I'm wrong, two or three fouls. It was down to that third overtime and, uh, Really just a, I mean, I could go on and on about the the calls and the referees of this matchup because I would imagine that most Utah fans would agree with me that Pac-12 officiating has been pretty atrocious all season. And I'm allowed to say that because I'm not a player, so I can't get fined. The refereeing has been horrible this year and... Uh, the refs didn't skip a beat tonight, and I don't want to blame a loss on the refs because we missed a ton of crucial shots. There were plenty of moments where we should have scored and we should have taken leads and uh, capitalized on big opportunities that didn't go our way. Shots weren't falling, right? Uh, uh, bad percentage shots, stuff like that. So I'm not blaming the loss on the refs, but it was almost so clear and evident that there was a bias towards Arizona from this refereeing crew. At least that's what it seemed like. It seemed like the referees had placed a parlay and and Arizona winning was the last leg, right? Because it seemed like we were breathing, breathing within six feet of the Arizona team and getting called for fouls. I mean, it was ridiculous. By the, by the third overtime, by the second overtime, by the, shoot, by the end of regulation, you could just tell that our team... Uh, just everybody on our team was extremely confused, frustrated, flustered, whatever word you want to call it with the refereeing and the, and the foul calls and the, again, I, I don't want to say I said bias. I don't know if I should say bias because right. You want to make sure that, you know, refs have a hard job. They're doing their best out there. And without them, the games wouldn't be able to be played, but it just seemed like uh, they were doing everything in their power to make sure that Arizona got to the free throw line. I mean, they were in the bonus, what, six minutes before we were in that second half. Um, really just kind of outrageous to watch some of those foul calls, especially in a game that is so heated and uh, such a big matchup. And, and you can tell both teams are going for it. Now, I understand when you have to, when there's a, a ton of force or a ton of contact or something like that, and the game's already kind of, you know, heated and back and forth, and you got to make a call to kind of let everyone settle down and know, hey, not everything's going to fly. But there was just some tic-tac fouls called in this game in crucial moments. Again, I mentioned K. Bakeda, what a freak athlete going to the final whistle. I mean, always looking for a block, always looking for a rebound, you know, a dunk, an alley-oop, whatever it may be. Uh, there was that, 
you know, Pella Larson pulled up from a, for a little mid range floater. Um, I believe it was in the second overtime and they called a foul on something that, that Kaba Kata just cleanly blocked, right? It was all ball and everyone's kind of looking at each other. Like, are you kidding me? Like, how is that a foul? Well then of course, you know, Oh, it was on Jake Whalen. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that name. That's how the announcers and, and that's how, you know, the arena staff were pronouncing his last name. But, uh, Jake Whalen, I, I he kind of brushed against maybe the foot or something of Pella Larson and they called that a foul. And it was, you know, just a nasty block by Kata. And I was, I'm just sitting there like, is that really a foul? That's really what we're gonna we're going to call in this crunch time. So, um, you know, very frustrating stuff to see there, kind of. But uh, but nevertheless, we battled for 55 minutes of basketball. Our team was, uh, ne- you know, despite a 16 point deficit at halftime, they came out looking hungry as ever. They got the crowd fired up. They got right back into it. Went on that 11 and 0 run. Uh, with six minutes left in regulation, and then of course battled it all the way to triple overtime. Didn't go the way we hoped, but again, I think this game proved that this team is capable of being who we all think they can be, and uh, that some of these players are just consistent, right? So, uh, just fun to watch. So, wanted to talk about that game because again, it was such a it was it was that date that everyone had circled. It was oh, but we still got that Arizona game to to really prove something. And even though it's not going to be marked as a win, it's uh, it definitely proved that this team is here to battle. And this team is going to, I think, turn a lot of heads in Mar- come March. Because, uh, you know, as, an, as a projected eight seed, and that's going to fluctuate, I'm sure, within the next month or so, uh, you know, as an eight seed projected, I think that this team is going to cause some havoc. And uh, it's going to just be fun to watch for the rest of the season. And again, still got that final Pac-12 tournament in Las Vegas that, uh, you know, assuming that Arizona stays kind of amongst the top in the ranks for Pac-12 standings, um, maybe Utah can find their way to sort of finagle into that championship game in Vegas. And uh, maybe we'll get a little bit of taste of some, some rematch action. But uh, nevertheless, exciting stuff to watch again heartbreaking but uh some really key takeaways go back and watch the highlight tapes go back and appreciate some of the the big effort plays from guys like kb brandon carlson uh davon and uh and then you know also just kind of pay attention to some of the things that didn't go well right free throw shooting um you know maybe some three-point percentage shots in that first half were pretty pretty atrocious to say the least but um go back and take a look at all those things and uh, be ready for this team to come back hungry and to close out the Pac-12 regular season with a chip on their shoulders saying, hey, we should have beat Arizona, but we're going to go ahead and continue to dominate for the rest of our, for the rest of our schedule and we're going to get it done. And uh, we're going go to we're gonna go to Vegas, make a run, and then we're going to be in March and make a run. So this team's here to stay. Got to keep believing in them. Again, the name of the game around here, Believe in Utes. I sure am. Hope you are. What an electric game. And uh, we'll bounce back soon, right? As always, thank you so much for tuning in to Believe in Utes. I'm Jake Popoff. I'll talk to you very soon. Maybe we'll have some more football. Maybe we'll have some more basketball in the next episode. But nevertheless, come on back. Let's talk some Utah athletics. Feel free to drop a like, a comment, whatever you got to do. Let me know what you thought of this game. Do you think that, uh, you know, was I, did I have a bad perception on any part of this game? Let me know down in the comments and uh, shoot me a DM on Instagram at Jake Popoff, whatever you want to do. As always, thanks. Talk to y'all soon. Go Utes.